Hello? Well, let's, let's, let's begin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, tonight it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, Sir Peter Cook, the GSD for 2014 uh, Kenzo Tange Visiting Professor. Sir Peter Cook is the 36th recipient of this distinguished post. Established in 1983, the, Tang the Tange Chair honors the legacy of Kenzo Tange, as mostly all of you know, the great post-war Japanese architect and urbanist, by bringing to the GSD its turn an international recognized architect or urbanist as visiting professor. Over the past three decades, the Kenzo Tange Visiting Professorship has invited some of the world's best known and most respected architects from Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Let me proudly mention that Spain with Moneo, Enric Miralles, Juan Navarro, Elias Torres, Antonio Cruz, Antonio Ortiz, and myself <laughs> <laughs> is the best represented country, 23rd percent of the total number of the Tange chairs. In England, it, it, the, the case is different. There, there are a huge variety of Tanges too, almost all imported or exported, as is traditional in, in England. Uh, so Saha Hadid, Farsid Musavi, you all know. David Ajay, you all know. Louis Hatton, ex-student of Peter. Uh, and Cecil Balmon. So in many ways, it was time to complete the list with someone undoubtedly British, whose contribution to our profession is undoubtedly universal. And no one is a better candidate, for sure, for this position than Sir Peter Cook. His contribution is and has been so extensive, complex, and deep that for many of us it's really difficult to identify a memorable, a single memorable uh, project or building of the last decades whose genealogy is not linked in one or another way to some moment, idea, provocation, reference uh, coming from the brain of Peter. As everyone knows or should know well, he was one of the founding members of Archigram in the 60s, a group of then young architects of the AA that changed definitively the way we think about modernism, utopia, technology, everyday life, the future, and so on. And also the way we represent, draw our dreams as architects. As our dean would say, he's not here today, it's not a small project. He taught at the AA was in the 70s director of the ICA uh, for a couple of years, three years, I think, in London. Uh, and from this on, he has been deeply involved in constructing the international academic prestige of, of the Barlet School of Architecture, University College London, as the chair of the Department of Architecture from 1990 to 2006. And now the, he has a position as senior fellow of the Royal College of Art in London. I'm just trying to concentrate his CV in the most interesting and most important posts. And he and his colleagues in Akiran were awarded also with the Royal Gold Medal of the RIBA in 2004. And in 2007, he was knighted by the Queen for his services to architecture and teaching. His practice, <coughs> now called uh, CRAB, uh, made with uh, uh, Gavin Robohan uh, has given way to some well-known uh, buildings in Europe and Australia. Uh, to quote some, I will mention the most known, the Friendly Alien, so-called, in Graz, Austria, the Avidian School of Architecture at Bond University in Australia and the Gold Coast, and, and the business or uh, the law faculty in Vienna, uh, uh, recently finished, and uh, these two last in with his last partner, Gavin, in um, I'm, I'm not going to extend um, on his legacy. I mean, it's always a temptation to begin to talk about it, but, but I will try to focus in a couple of books, and, and that's it. No? Uh, 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 I, I, uh, not, I will not resist the opportunity to mention uh, a couple of, of, of the most influential books. This, this is the Spanish, well, the Argentinian version. I had when I was a student. One of the, it was, we were commenting now that it was so cheap that almost every student could buy it. it was, but it was so beautiful, so pop. No? And, 
um, Architecture, Action and Plan. It was published in the 67 by Studio Vista, translated like 10 years later, no, eight years later to Spanish. Uh, and it was one of the most read books uh, in the schools of architecture and, uh, at, at the beginning of the 70s. It was a really nice publication, small, wonderful cover, especially in Spanish, in the, the yellow one. And more importantly, it was full of incredible images. I mean, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> but it was, the, but it was the, it, it's, it's very important. I mean, the images were in super sexy. I mean, it was impossible to resist uh, the book. And, and you could, I mean, you could pass from one page to the other to, from uh, strange, um, super bizarre uh, combinations. So from the Moctezuma, this is the Moctezuma Valley in Verde Valley in Arizona, a kind of historical thing. And the next page is the section of the Philharmony of, by Sharon with a fantasy, a kind of fantasy, industrial fantasy by Chernyshevko, and then immediately close, you have classic drawings of Doric and Tuscan columns, and, and then the next page is Mendelssohn, and in the next page, in one page, you have Le Corbusier, Mendelssohn, and Gaudí, and so on and so on. I, mean, I, I think the Isozaki, Poelfic, Miss van der Rohe, the Paul Rudolph's garage at New Canaan, all these things are um, put together, and it's not, I mean, you can imagine that it's, it's a, a super eclectic, and it's not, it's not eclectic. I mean, that is, is the important thing. For me, it was a new, clearly pop way to look back at the whole experience of modernism. And for the first time, someone was looking at it as our tradition of innovation and action, as something that has been gone forever, and is still, in a way, a huge lesson, and is still active in our minds. No? I, I can continue with other books, but I just want to, to go to, well, the, a primer in 96, dedicated to Enrique uh, Miralles, uh, with a beautiful small photo in the first page. Or um, other of my favorites, the monograph of uh, A plus U, dedicated to the work of Peter Cook in 1989, where he elaborated on drawings of hybrid ruined fantasies of glass skyscrapers almost demolished, covered and mixed with landscapes that suddenly <coughs> allow us to visualize uh, not only the very British picturesque vein that in reality, or this is my interpretation, gives continuity to all his work, but also shows uh, a very clear influence of Bruno Taut's uh, fantasies, drawn utopias like the Alpine architecture or the crown of the city or the builder of the world. And, and I think that it is, is, is really emotional and very interesting to see these two influences of this, that are deeply rooted in all his work no? and, and, and gives you a lot of clues to understand his work. I stop here <laughs> with a mention to these profound influences that he's across all his work and explain partially his vital attitude as an architect in permanent love with utopias, history, landscapes, drawing, discussions, experience, and obviously education. Please help me to extend a warm, warm welcome to Sir Peter Cook. From that amazing introduction, it's going to be downhill all the way, I'm afraid. Um, and I called this chat <coughs> nose to nose because um, I, like, I like a certain kind of slimy confrontation. I don't really like sort of head-on bang confrontation, but I like things where the nose will rub up against another nose. And um, I also physically, in architectural terms, enjoy things that have a nose shape. I only realized this about a year ago and have started to introduce this into lectures. But um, I'm sure if there, there's probably some very clever person from one of the departments of Harvard uh, in the psychology department, I suppose, who would be able to analyze this and, 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 and talk about my grandmother or, or, or British phlegm or something terrible. I don't know. Um, but. It is going to be sort of a series from time to time of contrast. I am 
a provincial Englishman. That is to say, I didn't move to London until I was 21. And I think being a provincial is a very interesting issue. I think it's particular, particularly loaded in, in England and probably France uh, more than anywhere um, because the centre is so powerful, the central city is so powerful. But I was, as a child, and the son of an army officer, who, uh, who, one of whose tasks was to look at buildings. I was taken as a tiny top to look at buildings, and I, by the time I was about, I don't know, 10 or so, I, I literally was consciously collecting cathedrals and castles. A little bit later, I made balsa wood models of cathedrals, but uh, I, I collected them like some people collect stamps or, or railway numbers. And this continued as my background until I really started reading about architecture. And I rather, because of this background, living in a number of different cities, since my dad was in the army, uh, some of which were Roman cities. One city had 40, this particular city, Norwich, has 40 medieval churches. And quite frankly, if you live in a city with 40 medieval churches, you get rather used to them. You go past one of these things, just another fucking me medieval church, you know. <laughs> and, and, and then I started reading about architecture. And I jumped, as it were, very at, at the point at which I saw this picture in a book. Asplund Stockholm, Lime, um, As As Asplund Stockholm Restaurant in the Stockholm Exhibition of 1930, which, of course, was pulled down before I was born and which I've never seen in anything other than a black and white photo. And I think this is an interesting issue, which is that, that you see sometimes, you can see too much of a building. Sometimes you see the real thing. And I have a, a horrible suspicion that had I actually been and seen it, had it been there, I might have been disappointed. But to me, with this background of churches and cathedrals and old English towns and so on, it was like an aeroplane. It was as literally as exciting, it was like a biplane, it was like something that floated in the sky, it was gossamer, it was wonderful. And I became very excited by modern architecture. The irony is that at the age of 16, able, the last year to be able to go to architecture school that young, I went to the most traditional school in England, which was in my then hometown of Bournemouth, but I, I'm moving ahead a bit too much. One of the places I lived in was a very, very tiny seaside resort called Felixstowe, which has still this, this lunar park. And what I didn't realize was that, and, and I was bewitched by it. I, it remained in my head for a long, long time. And I went back many years later to take the photograph. It's still there. The lunar park had a helter-skelter, which a category which I would later be able to categorize as a megastructure. Underneath it is the crazy house made of some kind of combination of wire and cement, which I might later have categorized as expressionism. And alongside it is a building of a certain kind of decoration, which I might later have recognized as art deco. But of course, as a 13-year-old, I didn't know these labels, I didn't need these labels, but I was fascinated, something in me was fascinated by the juxtaposition. On the other hand, moving to a larger seaside town, which had a certain kind of aspirational history, Bournemouth was in the late 19th century an escape town, and it was a place where the intention was to plant the pines that would hold the sand and give delicious smells, and old people would go there to die and live another <laughs> 10 years, which is always said. But at that time, there was this background, and I was, of course, reading when the cathedrals were white. I first studied in, a in this tiny reactionary school in the shed, which was in the church hall of this particular church. Interestingly, a rather good uh, piece of... of uh, Gothic revival because that town of Bournemouth is full of Gothic revival churches. So these were hovering over me. Whilst my first fave after, after Asplund and Le Corbusier 
was Roberto Burley Marx. I didn't know who this guy was. It was South American and exotic and weird and did that. <laughs> Fortunately, I met the guy many, many years later, but, but it's just nose-to-nose -nose confrontation of these strange things. Somewhere my architectural path was affected by one and pulled towards the other. And I actually sort of bypassed the, being enamoured with neoclassicism. I, I've never really got to classicism. I've never really got to rationalism. I've never really got to all this diagrammatic stuff that you do in the core here. I, 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 it's never, it doesn't resonate. I don't find it very interesting. <laughs> but I do, find, I do find Gothic revival very interesting. And I find Roberto Burley Marx very interesting. Still, I haven't grown up, you see. And, and I, won a comp I was lucky in winning a competition about a year and a half out of the AA. And, and the great thing was that I was either to, able to buy a leather jacket and take taxes and eat slightly better. Um, and at that time, of course, there was Archigram that came... The interesting thing about Archigram, just a slight correction, they didn't all come from the AA. I was the only AA graduate. The interesting thing about Archigram was that our ages ranged over 10 years. And we all came from different schools of architecture. We all had quite different tastes in music, in women, in clothing, in books, in uh, politics maybe a little bit together, but not, not vehemently. And I think that was in a way its strength that we brought to the table many different things. And within Archigram, we often were almost in a sort of sub-competition. It was much more like a, a studio in school where there's something going on behind you, something in front of you. You team up for this project, two of you, maybe three on that one, maybe everybody on something, one in the corner. Ron would bring in the walking city, so I'd bring in the plug-in city. Somebody else would do a computer city. Somebody would say, hey, that's not a bad idea and you'd go off into a corner. But we did have one reiterant phrase that we used uh, when we were doing, when we knew we were onto something. We would say, this will upset them. We never said who the them were, but we knew who they were. They were everybody outside there who didn't, you know, who, 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 the great unwashed British Philistine. Um, but as you see from the, the bits and pieces, it was, was in a sense a coalition was in a sense a coalition and, and for those who are still alive of the Archigram group you will get a different story of the story. I was then from, the, from 1964 brought in to teach at the AA. I'd been for two years on many juries. I must have been good at it because at one point I got sacked from the office I worked in because I was always in the AA on a jury. And I think that that was interesting because there was a big difference between being a juror, a, a, a snotty, clever dick juror, <laughs> and, and, and being a teacher. Not only did I find that my boss had a nervous breakdown, I was left in charge of 85 students, the diploma students at the age, of whom 10 were my age and one was twice my age. Very scary, very different from giving a smart-ass comments in a, in a crit. You had to be an amateur psychologist, and I virtually <laughs> dried up. I virtually didn't do a drawing for a year. But I, before I had started, this particular project, the early versions of this project, had been published not in an obscure architectural magazine, but in a Sunday colour newspaper which is read by more than a million people. And when I was introduced, this, some, this, this person who was supposed to be the humble assistant to the fifth, a very humble person who would normally sit behind a door and be quietly useful. I wasn't, I was this weirdo who'd done this project that everybody had seen. And I think it was interesting, so I have never had the benefit of anonymity. I've never been the quiet little helpful teacher behind the door because everybody knew I did this stuff. Uh, and there were many stuffs. I think what is, in retrospect, interesting is the use of the term city, particularly when it moved on to being things like the instant city, which is a kind of circus, interest, 
By the way, this drawing was drawn in Los Angeles, thinking about England. And Ron Heron did a parallel in St. City, which was drawn in Los Angeles, thinking about Los Angeles. And I think there's a lot of the ingredients of, of, of I mean, the reason why Archigram was su were such fans of Los Angeles and then subsequently of Tokyo is because that was our kind of stuff. And in a way, even this drawing, I will admit, somewhere subconsciously was influenced by the stuff down the street. But it's, it's sometimes difficult being your own art historian, although if you live long enough, of course, you, <laughs> you have to become your own art historian because there's so many strange things written about what, what you were supposed to have done that you have to shout harder. Um, I'm skipping a lot of material, but there's one series that crops up. Um, I've never been commissioned to design a tower, but I, and I'm not very good on heights, actually. I don't like looking out of the sort of 50th floor at all, but I design towers for towns that I know. It's like a sort of thing, it's like, well, like some of you sketches dogs, you know, you, you, you go to a place, and my, my rule is that I've got to have at least been in the town for a month. Uh, otherwise, I don't feel I can comment enough. And, and one of the towns I've been in, certainly much more than a month, and on many occasions, is Oslo. And at the time I did this project, a long time ago, Oslo had no high-rises. And I felt that it was a fascinating... I was fascinated by the light conditions of Oslo, because it's darker than England at the... At the in half of the year, it's gloomy, and in fact, it's, it's, people are suicidal or alcoholic for long periods of the year. But one of the things that fascinated me were the lanterns that <coughs> predominate buildings of about the early part of the 20th century up to about 1930, which are large lanterns that are ob often at facia height um, and illuminate the streets. And of course, there's relatively cheap electricity. And people leave their lights on a lot. And this was fascinating uh, to the English provincial. And so I made these pro this project to do with lanterns. The little lantern at street level moved up the building and became a kind of bay window lantern, moved up the building and became a room-sized lantern, and then an apartment-sized lantern, and then a lantern of the whole building. And in the daytime, I appropriated a certain palette of colours that, that um, the functionalist architects in Norway used, which in fact were borrowed from the painters, which in fact borrowed them from the plateau up in the southern middle of Norway. And so I'm fascinated by, already by this issue of coloration as well as illumination. Other cities I've been in for more than a month, Brisbane, uh, which um, was early days with Australia, where I was fascinated by the tradition of the bungalow, the metal bungalows, largely pieces imported from the UK. And I then said one can contrast the 20th, as it was then, 20th century air-conditioned office with the bungalow upon bungalow upon bungalow of, of a housing block. And that was the proposition on that drawing. Later, in, in my wife's city, which is Tel Aviv, I was fascinated by the idea of, of sun shading, and Tel Aviv is another town which I spent more than a month in. And, and I guess I <laughs> would be interesting to speculate, if I add up my time as Kenzo Tangi, whatever I am, um, I, 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 I might uh, be able to do, do a quickie for, for Cambridge, why not? Uh, vertical, of course. Um, on the other hand, one has, sometime, one has spent many, many years doing projects for which there was no money, that's pretty often, <laughs> even when you get commissioned, but also for which there was no client, there was no competition. One just said, hey, I'm interested in this, I'm going to bloody do it. Uh, and I'm homing in on one old one, which I haven't used in lectures uh, for a long time until recently. I just, that, that I do, I have a lot of stuff and I leave, I've left a nice one up because you mentioned it, the Berlin one. Haven't got it in the lecture tonight, but I've got this one in, 
which was an invented town, subconsciously based upon my, again, my East, East of England provincial childhood of a gentle river valley and, and, and higgledy-piggledy hedges and, and it just moving out. And, and I've got a series, I, I work back from a series of people types. I invented the people uh, and I invented then what would surround them. And so group A are a kind of well-heeled, hedonistic uh, pair of people. They have uh, two bathrooms and, uh, you know, they, they dress up and they don't spend a lot of time in them. So they live in a very superficial kind of sleek building, which is even hidden from the street by advertising. Or there's a tough kind of New york -y type people where... Uh, there's obviously some storyline here about the two women and the window cleaner who just carries on cleaning the window while it all plays itself out. And it's behind a metal facade. Or there's this uh, quotation of, of the English. Uh, there are, of course, cr cricket pitches in the front, a wall to hide what really goes on. And, and a group of people in the family the, the uh, rather pompous son, the, the father who's obsessed by pretending he knows a lot about French wine, which is a <laughs> typical in English characteristic, or tries to do French cooking. Uh, and, and the wife who enjoys comfort but has no taste, and the daughter who's rather naughty. <laughs> but it's all all right because it's all under the trees. Or this which is the standard issue of the time, standard issue family, uh, two children, sensible car, uh, orthogonal organization. Or the old Viennese couple who have escaped from, from uh, maybe Nazi Vienna, uh, bringing special objects with them. And unlike the, the hedonistic couple, have real plants in the window, not plastic ones and live on a quiet peninsula. Or the dreamers and the poetic who live in towers. And that's a long time ago, but I was already fascinated. I think it was, it's to do with teaching, actually. Teaching is largely sniffing out, to use the nose analogy again, sniffing out the psychology of the students, whether they can turn a corner, whether they're being influenced by something is, is usually fairly easy detective work, but actually what will make them come alive is harder. And that's why I'm fascinated by the scenarios of people. I'm fascinated by gossip. I'm a terrible gossip. And <laughs> I'm fascinated by how and where and who and, ah, that's, watch that funny guy in the corner. Doesn't say much, but could be interesting. <laughs> I'm also fascinated, and, and, and this is a, a disappointment so far, uh, one of the things now in later life that I have started building, I've been able to pull out of the back pocket a few things that fascinated me for a long time. My fascination with vegetation, I have not yet worked into a project. But I have been intrigued for a long time by the business of knitting not just putting a wall made of veg, but of knitting vegetation into the very substance of a building. I was giving many years ago a lecture, in, in, as I have done a lot in Germany, and it's a wonderful thing that happens to you sometimes when you give a lecture. Somebody sort of sidles up to you at the end of the lecture and says, there's a thing like your thing down the road. Or, did you know that so-and-so did your thing in... 1910, and yours, there are two alternatives to this. One is to say, well, you know, my, my life is but a sham. It's all been done. <laughs> or you say, right, bloody good idea, right. And so, typically, somebody came up to me and said, uh, I think I was in, I don't know, Darmstadt or somewhere. Somebody said, is this a, is this, is the Schloss Karlsruhe? You must see the Schloss. 
And indeed, what's interesting about the Schloss Castle is, is this wonderful external room. Now, a boring person later said, oh, come on, don't get excited. They had glass in it. But they didn't. I found the, the original drawing. They did not have glass in it. It was intended that it would be a growing and that the growiness would create the space. And there it is. It's a wonderful. Another uh, German favorite, Schwetzingen, done by Italian gardeners of the 18th century where the armatures carry the vegetation. And I can't get this stuff out of my head. I even occasionally go back to these two places and just remind myself how, how good they are. So at one point, I did a project called Veg House. By the way, I like the word veg rather than vegetation. It's less pompous. It's like meat and two veg. <laughs> you know, comes off the table. So I call it Veg House, and it's a vegetated house. The plan is a triangle. There's some sort of pictorial versions of it on the right, and it's on a cliff, and in the early stage, it has some armatures which will attach, have vegetation attached to them and some enclosures. It's all very circumspect. And then it starts to grow, the armatures fill up. Even the kitchen becomes a kind of monster where there's vegetation creeping around the back of the frying pan. I'm not quite sure how that would work. <laughs> and, and, and the beginning of, of using, and, and it was a long time since Sarkogram that I hadn't used words drawn onto the drawing in order to, to kind of um, encourage a certain way of thinking. The word del, it's a romantic word. It's a, so it's not just a space between, it's a dell, it's a, it's a fold. Okay, we move on in time, the thing starts to get more hectic, the, the dell is closed, and they are layered dells, and, and, and funny, creepy things that are a mixture of, of, of hi-fi and, and, and things that grow grapes on. And, and I, was, I was fascinated by by hybrids, all the time I've been fascinated by hybrids, the hybrid between the growy and the enclosure and the comfort thing. And it moves on. And it slopes and it weaves and it folds and the glades move and it becomes more and more creepy and strange. And then it moves on, getting very strange, constantly weaving and folding and it's getting bits of hidden and bits of damp and so on. And then the final drawing, it got totally out of control. <laughs> I say to myself, stop. <laughs> God knows where it's going. <laughs> I've lost it. <laughs> but if you backtrack, I then became fascinated by the proposition of the veg village. Imagine several, <laughs> several of these houses suppurating against each other, nose to, well, not even dripping nose to dripping nose, I would say. Uh, to use a terrible analogy. Um, and, and one thinks sideways about a, a condition that has always fascinated me, which is, interestingly, the photograph taken a mile away from where my working partner, Gavin Rowbottom, was born. I didn't know that when I took the photograph. It, 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 so he's a man of, 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 of this strange territory. Neither land nor water, sometimes land and sometimes water. The idea of ambiguity of, of both component and territory and edge. Much more recently, I made an elaborate drawing. Actually, I, I, I drew it mostly in, in Oslo and colored it in London for what it's worth. Um, and it is of an invented landscape which is very deliberately including parts which are almost certainly constructed or made of constructed parts. They are straight. Even if you look closely, there are some that start to have tectonic form. But they are folded in amongst a series of vegetational parts which are random, but they're not quite so random. They drift in a certain kind of way. They, they cluster in a certain kind of way. 
And in, in a larger part of the drawing, you see that I even then quite deliberately insert some rather naughty bits of architecture, just to say, yes, architecture is involved here somehow. But again, I cannot resist the temptation to call it a city. And I'm fascinated by the, the haunting quality of the house or the city. They crop up, not only in my own work, but in other people's work, where we, by making an anti-city, we are talking about the city. By making a non-house, we are talking about the house. Another set of drawings, um, made in our office under, under the direct supervision of Gavin and I, but not actually constructed, well, bits of it were drawn by us here and there, is a thing called Soak City, which is taking the proposition that with global warming, London will disappear under the water. And so that it is a sort of megastructure, but this time not a, not a steel and plastic and glass megastructure. It's a anything you can find and rescue megastructure. It's like a, it's a series of sort of hollowed out <coughs> trees that are knocked together by do-it-yourself people using a few zinc nails. That's the proposition. Albeit that it cannot prevent itself from having some drama and some me mechanistic overturns. And I'm not sure whether we're really equipped to be survivalists, whether, the, whether the, the intrigue of mechanism takes over. And there are a few reiterant themes of the, of the vegetation and so on, some of which become even more interesting. And, and, and you would know the man that we work with on this because he, was, he gave you your first teaching job, right, as you told me the other day. This interesting character, Salvador Perez Arroyo, who has disappeared somewhere into Vietnam because there are nice ladies there, um, is, 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 is a key figure here. But we worked together with him on this uh, eco-tower, which would have been a fascinating combination of his interest in, in, in um, computer technology and some fairly normal basic principles of drawing dampness up into the core of the building and dealing with the skin. It, it, whenever we've done a project with Salvador, it's been always very, very amusing, interesting, and, and technically pushes us forward, by the way. Now, another theme, I suppose, is that of color. And we just won a, the WAF Colour Prize, so I guess I'm going to thump on about colour for a day or two. But uh, many years ago, my first building of any size at all for, with, with a, a colleague called Christine Hawley was a blue building, was a blue house, which is in Berlin, done as part of the, um, the programme of... of buildings done in the 80s under, under Kleihus. And it's a simple piece of social housing with some slightly amusing tops and uses the tradition of the winter garden. So the west side is double height winter gardens, looks out over the park. The east side is small, small windows, bedrooms, and bathrooms, and is quiet. There have been other blue buildings, blue number three, blue number four, which is just about, number four is just about to go on site next week. And I suppose best known is the blue building in Graz, uh, known sometimes as the friendly alien. And in this English publication quoted as the attack of the blobs and blob blob is a wonderful I loved it being called a blob I don't know whether I'm a blobist but my god I in thoroughly enjoyed it being it's a blob <laughs> and I was fascinated that the, 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 the Germans they're grosser blob 
And there was even a conference, and I've got, I found, I managed to find the, uh, the catalog for it, which is this wonderful combination, Meister, which of course is a Germanic term, Master, the Meister, und der Blob. Das ist der Blob Meister. I love it. I love it. It's so ridiculous. It's, and, and of course, we have a, we have a legitimate history of, of blobism in, in England, which, which you'll understand from the Palm House in Kew, which is a wonderful blob building. And Mr. Blobby, who was a children's TV person. And the blob made it onto a stamp, so that's all right. So blob, I love the whole blob thing. And Warren played it. There's a moment in this unsuspecting Austrian bourgeois city where you walk along a little back street and there's a bomb sticking out. <laughs> so if somebody's bomb is sticking out, that is the blob! <laughs> <laughs> My God, yes, and the blob, he sits, I think he sits comfortably within the scale of the building. I think he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, like a dog sitting in a basket, he doesn't really, and if you actually look at the tops of some of those churches, there were some guys doing blobs then, it's not a, it's not a, you put the blob on the top and you, you, you know, make the sign of the cross and you're in business, and, 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 and I, I, I think that the other thing about the building was that both Colin Fournier, who I did it with, he knew Graz even better than me. His girlfriend came from Graz, and, and I had been there about eight times. And I knew the site, because I'd been with groups of Bartlett students onto the site, because there was a bar that was the only bar open at three o'clock in the morning. So between us, we, we had done a lot of site research. <laughs> And, and we were able in the competition, I think, to be fairly radical because we knew that one side had very noisy trams, another side was a bit spooky, another side was sitting under the trees, that the bridge in front was so wide that it acted more or less like a plaza rather than just a bridge, and things like that, and that the river is very fast and, and noisy. Things like that which give you something to work work on to and the proposition of the project which was basically it was a pin and a skin the pin rose up through the building as a travelator and the skin wrapped it and when you went up the pin the exhibit area was a surprise it was hidden which was actually based on an old archigram exhibition that we'd done many many years before the plan has to also incorporate on the top and the left, some pre-existent buildings. The one on the left is the earliest cast iron building in southern Austria, the Eisner's house, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And on the right in this ground plan, you see that it's mostly restaurant, toilets, kitchen, a lecture space, fairly straightforward, and what we call the kangaroo pockets, which is these sort of wobbly pieces that contain fire escapes and so on. And then you move up the pin into the gallery space. And in fact, if you're sitting in the restaurant and you see your friends disappearing just up into somewhere, 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 the unknown. And as I say, that was based upon an exhibition we'd done many years before where we also had a staircase in the middle of the lower level, and it went up into the unknown, this notion of the unknown. The other one I immediately think of is Itsuka Hasegawa's uh, building, the astronomy building, where again you disappear up into the unknown. It is an idiosyncratic space, but it seems to be popular with a number of, I mean, artists either don't want to exhibit there at all, or absolutely relish working something into it. Another irony is the whole business of the indigenous. Yes, there is a building on the left that at great expense and loss of life we had to reconstruct, to prop it up, make it worthy of, of being used as a public building, reclad with the original cladding.
because it was part of the heritage of Austria. And then we found that the pieces of metal had been brought from England in the 19th century, that there were some British loonies who sold the Austrians this metal building, and some more English loonies who sold the Austrians this plastic building a uh, hundred odd years later, which I think tells you about heritage. I mean, bullshit. Heritage is often total bullshit. <laughs> I love it when it is. I love it. I, you know, everything's vernacular as soon as you've done it. Yeah, it's vernacular. What the hell? Um, I, of course, another conversation, because most of the journalists uh, referred back to Archigram and said this was an Archigram building. I, I'm, I'm not in a position to say, it's for you to say. But one thing, of course, was that we might have made things that had this kind of physiognomy in the Archigram times, and we might not. We would have not had the computers that could actually run it through. It would have been unbelievably expensive and difficult. These boys, these, these roof lights, were landed using Rhino. The first one took probably four hours for the person to work out the Rhino, because like, they're all landing on slightly different conditions of the skin. Second one took about three hours. And, and, so on. And, 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 and the young lady who'd come in from Vienna went back two days early because it was easier <laughs> than Colin and I ever thought it would be to land them onto the skin. All, all the orifices face north except for one of them, which is the naughty nozzle, and he doesn't face north <laughs> because he faces the castle. And people queue up to look at the castle that they've just seen before they came in <laughs> because you deny them it and then you make it as a special, which again was an old rerun of an earlier exhibition where Mike Webb had invented these periscopes that stuck out of the gallery facing the London bus, which you had just arrived in. But as soon as you deny it, it becomes an art piece. Though I think the most important art piece is actually the view from the needle, the cantilevered part at the top, where you see where you line up with the river valley and you see the whole of Graz. And in fact, it was originally in the in the competition project, it was the restaurant. But the fire fire regulations made it very difficult to sustain it as a restaurant. And so the city said, Well, you don't need it then, do you? We and and, and, and Colin and I were like a couple of Kids, we flounce. We say, oh, no, 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 you must keep it because it is important compositionally. <laughs> and in fact, it is important compositionally. And how, how rarely do we discuss composition? Open question to Harvey. How rarely do we discuss composition? And how rarely do we admit that despite the apparent newness of the object, it is in fact a traditional building. It is clad with pieces, just as is the roof-tiled house in front of it. Piece upon piece upon piece upon piece, and a bloke kind of fixing it on top of an impermeable, rain-catching condition, just like the tiles. We had a brilliant engineer who I love working with called Klaus Bollinger, and I think Without him, it would have been a much poorer building. I, I, I love working with really, we, we're on, on the blue building now, we're working with, with um, Kara's people as well, who I think comes here, and Kara, and, and it's, it's, it's always wonderful. I mean, we have a long, uh, as an AA student, we were encouraged in fourth year already to work with Arab engineers, and so once one's whole career has been working always with the engineer often pushing you further than you would have dared do yourself. Another thing that one realises with, with age or with time and actually building is that some of the best spaces of the building are interstitial spaces that you didn't really calculate. You just end up having them as a gift. Some of the most, I find, exciting conditions of the building are ones like this. But something that we did intend was the notion of melting the skin, right? of melting the skin 
peeling away the layers of the skin through density, less density, translucency, and peeling it to momentarily to transparent and back again. We wanted to have many of these spots on the building, and the city got nervous that we were wasting a lot of time and spending a lot of money. So we sort of wrapped us on the knuckles, and we did a couple of them and retreated. And of course, the other statement made by the building is that you wrap it almost with a sort of body painting of, of pixels. It's not pixelated program pixelation with a flat screen, as you often get in, in those sort of rectangular boxes that have things flashing around. It's, it's actually like a body. It's draped over the building. The building, in a way, dis deliberately distorts the purity of the image, and it wears itself on it. And I like that. I, I'm pleased about that. Though I'm sure it's not by now, 12 years down the line, it's probably not, it's probably considered primitive by, by uh, a lot of lighting people. We won a competition for a theatre in Italy. And you can see that we bothered with the coloration of the town. They have a, they have a tradition of, of um, terracotta in that area. It's Italy. And they didn't build it. Uh, and, and those of you who know the way things happen in Italy will know that uh, you hardly ever get anything really built there. And you hardly ever get paid, I will say. But it was, it's one of our favorite projects. And um, we uh, were interested not only in the program, which was for a 500-person theater, and a bookshop, and a rehearsal room, and a dressing room, blah, blah, the usual stuff. But the fact that it's a small town, it's, not a, it's, it's, a, it's a rather small town, has, will have a tradition of people doing things out in the street. And our notion was to enable those things that go on in the street to climb up in and amongst our theatre and that the marketplace to, to encroach into the theatre and for the key part of the theatre actually to be the bar. That even on a wet Thursday there'd be people smoking and drinking and hanging out and on a, on a reasonably warm evening there would be movies being shown against the flank wall of the adjoining building and kids and mums and whatever could sit there and, it, and maybe when there was a visiting third rate t touring company that bothered to come there people would go into the theatre and you know have some white wine and say hello and then go to sleep in front of the play as what happens in provincials I'm, I'm a provincial I know that's what goes on in provincial theatres um, and uh, they're not Broadway, you know. Uh, but you make it an excuse for a place where people hang out. Uh, and you, and you mould the project accordingly. On the other hand, there are, there are irresistible things that one does. One finds that there are competitions for towers. Even if you suspect that the intentions of the competition are dubious, the prize money is good. And if you get second prize, which we did in, in this particular one, it keeps the office going <laughs> a couple of months <laughs> at the lowest possible level. And of course, in this particular version, there were, there were references, in a sense, back to my early days, the notion of the tower as a kind of coat hanger, the notion of the tower as an armature which is able to absorb a series of things that, that lock onto it. And this particular project was, was interested in, in the, the development of algae, using a public tower to demonstrate the use of algae. In a, in a later version of the project, we concentrated more upon the algae components. And in a later, later version of the project, we back began to incorporate other energy-creating mechanisms solar heating, wind power, and recycling. We made the project actually a, a kind of park, a, a, a closed park, because in Taichung, which is where it's located, you get some pretty hot weather and you don't want to be hanging out 
baking yourself in the power. And so again, the, in, this in this instance, the armature is clothed by a series of, of, of beards and clothes uh, working themselves up the building and a series of sub-buildings wrapped in, into that building. We love colour. And we did a competition, um, won by what was then called Foreign Office Architects, I have to say, with a non-coloured building. <laughs> but ours is coloured, and the colours, Birmingham is a very funny town, it's, it's, it's a bit of a grim place, but it does have some streets that have a, the beginnings of something interesting. We, we make the colour bounce into the various streets, so a slightly predominantly terracotta street is faced by the, the red colour, and Jan Kaplitsky's blue building is faced by the blue part of our project. And we enjoyed that, we enjoyed making a, a kind of kaleidoscope that would bounce back to the coloration of the town. In another unsuccessful competition bid, this time again in tai Taiwan, in Taipei, the music strip, which was for a series of music performance boxes. Uh, the, in this model, you see in the foreground the office building, which is in a sort of distille mannerism. It's a stiff mannerism, but bright colours. And then as you move along the strip, you find that the colours decrease in hecticness, but the form of the building becomes more hectic, so one's, there's a sort of double fold. You start, you start stiff but bright, multicolored, and then you become loose and single colored. And here we look at the thing down the strip or from the other end, where by now the forms have become much more exotic and the color has disappeared and the, the natural gardening increases. One becomes more and more interested in, in, in this whole business of surfacing. And, and those few of you who were in London the other day heard me talking about vocabulary, where really a lot of these exercises are exercises in the vocabulary of surface. And then we were able to apply our fascination for colour in Vienna, in the law faculty. A dangerous thing that I did at, it was a three, three layer, a three stage competition. A dangerous thing I did for the competition was to do one or two cartoons of which this one is suggesting that academic life doesn't need to be different from real life and that, that the Viennese penchant for getting drunk, uh, for doing naughty things in bedrooms, for disappearing under the table, for shouting and arguing uh, could be brought into the university itself. Uh, as I call it, cheerful and perverse Vienna. Uh, we also involved formalistically the notion of what we call sunshine corners because of the organisation of the sub-departments. We were able to wrap in and out. In fact, we made these, these, these sub-departments kind of clusters of space with interstitial space inside. Um, as somebody who's taught for an inordinately long time, one is fascinated by what can happen in addition to the curriculum in a good college. And here we see the sunshine corners and the notion of applied colour. The darkest colour is nearer the ground and then the colour becomes lighter as you move up the building. The central corridor we were not allowed to mess around with the small rooms, they had to be grey and white, but the central corridor uses the reverse. So in the light part of the building at the top, we use the darker carpet, and as you move down into the building, the carpet becomes lighter. It's a reverse process from the skin. Long time before, of course, I'd been playing with the idea of artificially, artificiality and colour. And it, it's one of those, I often use the term back pocket. You have some ideas and you put them in your back pocket 
hoping that one day you can take them out of the box, back pocket and say, oh, yeah, I think I'll use that one. You know? um, and then again, it's this thing of somebody saying, there's a thing like your thing down the road. Uh, and we were, as one is, in Valparaiso in Chile. And indeed, there was a thing like your thing down the road that some, and I've not been able to, I was with a couple of architectural historians, but nobody quite knows who the man or lady was who actually designed this. It's social housing, probably 1940s, difficult to say, um, in Valparaiso, which of course has a, a enormous amount of colour in the, in, the, in the old buildings of the city anyhow. So back to our building where also another thing going on was the laying of a kind of terracing on top of the law library, on top of the building. And the draping of a kind of beard across the building which brings the Habsburg forest, the, the Prater forest which is just behind the building brings it onto the surface of the building. So you're interested in bringing aspects of the forest and, and in a way sullying our own striations, that, that instead of them just being stripes and stripes and stripes, we said, yes, but we will then sully it, we will then distort it. Not killing it, not smothering it, but having a counterpoint to it. The other thing one sees here is the entrance condition where there are these two, the, the green poster is not there normally, but you, you have these two smiling cheeks or noses, again, between which you enter the building. It's a large, it's by far the largest building that we've made. It's about 200 metres long. It's actually two buildings. The bottom part of the plan is, in fact, the law building. And you can see the terracing going over the library, the, the, the fat bit. And then the admin, the central administration building, which is its, its sister. And we have these, tun these tunnels that run under the building that link the forest to the centre of the university. And we have these widening spaces in between the teaching rooms for people to foregather. And the, this is a plan of the library where you see also the pods that are dumped into the library with the roof lights above them where people can go and have private conversations but are still part of the library. And they are rather uh, brightly <coughs> coloured too, the, the pods. There, there are moments of quietness And the sunshine corners have persisted from the first scribble. And here you see the entrance between the two smiling noses or cheeks. And with a bit of uh, photographic distortion, even more nosery. Another thing that I've been interested in a long time and very difficult to pull off is the idea of comfort. I think that it is often an acquisition made to architects by others that we don't really design things to be comfortable. And I noticed that today when I needed in the last hour or so somewhere to sit comfortably. There isn't actually anywhere in this building that's very comfortable. It's over air conditioned and, and a bit hard on the bum. In, 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 in most places, if I may make the comment. Uh, it needs a Comfo Veg Club. The, the idea of the Comfo Veg is a comfortable, vegetated club with the implication that there are also some, some audiovisual effects. Another, play, another academic place in the United States, namely SIARC, invited me to make the Comfo Veg Club and I did, and about two years ago, and there it is, in their exhibition room, and it is a version of the Comfort Veg Club, a bit less technology, 
Uh, the veg is loosely interpreted, but it's very comfortable. In fact, it was so comfortable that it was reported to me that late at night, very naughty things went on in there, and that most of it has ended up in, in uh, Sayak students' apartments. Uh, so I, I treat that as a success. And then I've done something which I never have had the opportunity to do before. One starts off with a drawing, which goes on ice for a while, and then you interpret it as best you can. It moves. And then, in this case, I move back over the, the constructed part, held on to that, and then re reinvented the rest of the drawing. said, if now in Sark you can do that much of the Kampo Veg Club, what can you then do with the other parts? So it's like turning the thing over the real project, which sits, sits like in the filling of a sandwich of, of, of ideas. I hope to have opportunities to do that again. Another in interest of mine is of, of the town and, in a way, the tradition of the flaneur. The little town, don't forget I'm a provincial originally, the little town where nothing much happens. Uh, this town of Pinto is a little bit too close to Madrid and all the kids just get on the train and stay out till four in the morning. But it's a, I, the romantic in me says it's a bit of a pity. What would happen if you had a boardwalk and you wrap the boardwalk under the buildings and you brought kiosks onto the boardwalk and you had the guy who wants to show off there and the guy on the roller blade and the, the, the girl with the short skirt and all the people that you get in funny little towns. Uh, why not encourage them? That was part of a, of a master plan project, which again was done with Salvador. And noses again, as the buildings rub up against each other, they have these noses. Blue building number three was, in fact, the child of that project. Uh, and it was to be a blue building with sports facilities on the top and the kiosks sitting underneath. Jolly kiosks with noise and people with cigarettes even and flirting and buying oranges and whatever people do in kiosks. Uh, and there would be sport activities on the top. The city didn't want the sports activities. The building went up to third floor and then the builder went bankrupt. When a builder was found who could complete it, there was no money to make it really blue and nobody seems to want to open the kiosks, so the shells are there. And so this is the building as we have it. But the apartments are enjoyed. There are 100 families living in there. It works, but it isn't the same building. And it raises, of course, for me, maybe for the first time, this paradox that the, subs the substance of the building is there, the organization of the building is there, the flat plans are as they are, and they work, and blah, blah, blah. But these special increments, the, 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 the sunshade system, the sports facility, the the liveliness of the kiosks just aren't there. And it's how much can you strip it down before you lose it? And I don't know the answer to this. I merely, I merely throw it out as a, as, a, as a problem, as a paradox. And that you return to known conditions of folding a wall, having a column, or whatever. I have become fascinated by kiosks over the years. And, and there's a whole lecture to be given not now about kiosks. I go around the world collecting them. My favorite kiosk is in my wife's city of Tel Aviv, the one at the top, which was built in the 1930s to the German model. You have the boulevard, the trees, the kiosk at each end, and the, cro the cross street. It happens that this particular, there are 470 kiosks in Tel Aviv. It's a good kiosk town. And this particular guy, always has an enormous queue because he's very entrepreneurial. He's taken that little 1930s curved cornered model and exploited it to the full. He does the best juice in town. Whereas the, the Bremen kiosk is, is, is 
wholesome and, 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 and pleased with itself, but not as enterprising. The, the Copenhagen kiosk, of course, is of the old royal Copenhagen tradition. It's an elegant object. I'm not quite, I think they sell chocolates in it. Uh, the one below is a, in, a, in a Tokyo suburb, um, trying to rationalize the exuberance of a Tokyo sales condition. And the funniest one is in Pristina, uh, in Kosovo, where I was recently, uh, very overstyled, done by apparently the mayor's cousin or somebody, and, and, and falling to bits only about three years into being <laughs> made. And, but we're caught with a short straw because we have to construct a kiosk in Taipei next week. And it's been made, it was made yesterday actually, and so we're just hoping that no one's entering the fray. Of the and we've got some more kiosks to do in India, I'm told. So we are actually, you're putting, <laughs> putting your head where your mouth was. Having been an academic collector of kiosks, the ball is in one's court suddenly, which is what happened when Kleihus, uh, as I made a film about housing in Berlin, he said, all right, you do one, out of which came Blue, Blue Building Number One. So sometimes you're caught by your own petard. <laughs> the guy says, all right, stop chatting about it, do it. Our favorite kiosk, though, yet to be constructed, was a byproduct of a competition in Skopje. <laughs> we're completely stupid in our art. We, we do competitions which we know we're not, there's no way of us winning. This was a competition for a footbridge, right? Over the river. And I said, hey, could have a, we could have a kiosk on the footbridge. <laughs> and Gavin said, hey, we could make the kiosk move <laughs> across and back again, tell the time. And I said, hey, we could have a bar on the top of the moving kiosk so you can, kids can buy their chalk ice underneath. And then at six o'clock, the steps come down and you have a sliver bit, or whatever is the local brew. And indeed, that is the project. <laughs> Being caught by our own petard many years after the Brisbane Tower, we won a competition I in Queensland near not quite Brisbane, actually, the, the, the weird town of Gold Coast. Gold Coast? <laughs> Where the hell is that? It's a town of nearly 600,000 people with an international airport and two schools of architecture. But it's a sort of funny place. Anyhow, Arati Zazaki did the original arch building, and in order to develop it, one brought upon the fact that between us, Gavin and I represent 62 years of teaching in architecture school. He having been a graduate of both this place and the, and the Bartlett, and me of the A and Bournemouth, but having actually taught and lectured in many, many places. And the anecdotes back to knowing the people, watching the people, looking at their idiosyncrasies. Um, God, I'm getting cramped behind here. Um, looking at the various schools that one has known and saying that one's interesting because it's a funny view that you know we, we found ourselves talking like you know huh, you remember that crit space in ucla the one where you don't have to be involved you can look down you know the basement at the basket that's quite interesting you know the funny corridor that there is at the side of the a lecture hall where you can sneak out if you're you know blah 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 and we collected all these bits of anecdote and I love rubbing them together in one's head, or I enjoyed the other week a, a tiny few of you being transposed, and, and this is my special slide, can you spot the GSD faces at last week's Bartlett party? <laughs> but I must continue. <laughs> um, this is a very typical uh, condition, and I... I, I Having done the cartoons for, having done the cartoons for Vienna, I was encouraged by my colleagues to do more cartoons for this uh, competition in Australia. In fact, I ended up doing 25 cartoons. I'm not going to bore you with them all, but the favourite in the gang is is the caption of this one, 
where some sort of pipsqueak young faculty wants to show us, I question your terms of... I can't do the accent, but I do an English version. I question your terms of reference, Barbara. And there's Barbara kind of shaking. You know, and her friend, Willie, he's trying to put up a drawing, but you know, things are not... He's already very nervous. And, and the other guy, who is... This is a very typical sort of Bartlett quote. Somebody's made an electronic machine which was working on Thursday. <laughs> will almost certainly not work on the crit, but then, the, but then the, the professor will come running down the corridor to you after and say, he, just after you went out the door, it started working. But he's thoroughly phased. You know, it's, it's, it's never going to work. So the whole thing is a kind of nervous sound. And life imitates art because there is the original uh, Barbara, <laughs> at, at Sayak. Life imitates art because one of my cartoons was about this poor unfortunate guy who doesn't like, look like he can really pull the chicks, but, but, but he's, he's going to hang on in there and see what happens. And I actually discovered once we built the building, there was a dark-haired girl sitting on the platform, more or less where I'd drawn her in the cartoon. Or here, where one is encouraging the building to be used at all hours, and these guys, being Australians, of course, there's a bottle of wine on the table, and things are not going well. And a friend of theirs says, screw you, I'm going home, coming down the staircase. And there is indeed the staircase. Or the selective use of colour in the building, life imitating art, or the fact that the building is used as a pub... It's, it, I think it won the competition partly because the university saw that it at last would have an interesting space in which to have events. I mean, that's a very... Ask about face way of describing an architecture school, but it, it is so. And indeed, there are some very Australian-looking people uh, <laughs> with teeth and, and, and things <laughs> enjoying themselves. Uh, or, or here... <laughs> where, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> um, where, where the the one of the uh, professors is 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 extolling the virtues, or of course, my, uh, at the competition stage, I was flattering the institution. Of course, people would be coming in from Princeton uh, and 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 using the space, or. A favourite of mine, uh, I have found, particularly if you're directing a school, uh, uh, as well as being a sort of student who spends most of his time on, this beach, on the beach, like Jules here, um, that you need systems of escape. One of the key things is if you're a member of faculty is to, you see somebody very boring <laughs> coming in your direction. Is there a secondary <laughs> means of escape? Just as Jules has been caught or my, or my favourite player on this cartoon is actually the, the other member of the faculty who says, oh, Christ, I don't get involved in this, is heading off in a further route of escape. But the bridges, the bridges, seriously, folks, the bridges are an extremely important part of the operation. Or here is perhaps the most life-imitating art. I draw the cartoon of another poxy character who's rather saying... You have to set this is a point of departure. And there's this poor old guy in the class who's mortgaged his, his house in order to come as a mature student, thinking, what the fuck is this rubbish about? What's this guy about? <laughs> but the academic has his hands in emotion. <laughs> I, I had in the same space, uh, probably being equally uh, whatever. <laughs> Equally ridiculous. Um, or the, again, this is the quote of the, the UCLA condition where one says there's a way of being able to observe the crit or the activity without necessarily being standing alongside the eavesdropper. And in fact, we have exactly that condition in the building. And without going on and on and on about it, there are a number of other activities that ha happen in schools of architecture. Now the building 
like any building, is, is the product of organization. We start off with notions of, of a street and being Australia, a very warm side of the building and therefore the necessity of using the cool side of the building and getting light in but not direct sun. So there's a lot of calculating and folding. But the basic organization competition stage was the street running through the smaller rooms to the north, the hot side, and the studios on the south side. And it is on a hill, so that they rise, each, each group rises, and does the street also rise. In landing the contract, of course, money, we lose one of the bays, but we have these idiosyncratic elements that we call scoops. They are folded concrete that forms the primary structure, forms a, a clear street condition with the catching of the light, and around which we wind both parts, partly furniture and staircases. And then on the north, we have, as I said, the, the smaller rooms, the computer rooms, the postgraduate rooms, the administration, the toilets, the staircases, and so on. Very simple, basic system. And the entrance has a series of noses that welcome you, like the, like the Viennese noses. It's a simply constructed building in terms of material. It's in situ concrete and plywood with a tin roof. The noses sit out into space and some trees, instead of in the end of the trees being applied onto the surface, the trees are held down from the building. The forest is held around the building. And before this building was put there, there were quite a large bank of trees. And Gavin, my partner, does amazing sketches of, of these forms. But a lot of the time, like any building, and I guess every architect has this, a lot of it is simply having the basic idea and then refining and refining. The amount of time spent on the mullion patterning was enormous. The amount of time spent on knitting in the servicing was enormous after the basic decision of scoops, street, and chambers on the north, the big spaces on the south. And then the scoops themselves have to be engineered. And again, with computing, it's possible, as we did, to make the scoops each different from the other, but using a minimum number of conditions of formwork. We had to use imported German movable formwork, but we did a very limited number of computes of the formwork components so that we could get a number of scoops from the basically the same pieces of geometry. So we put our smartest mathematician lady on, on, on the project for a month to work out the, the geometries. And the builders were, were scared shitless. So it was a very interesting point reached both in the, in the, in the, in the Graz building before the mock-up of the skin was seen, everybody was nervous as hell. And they said, how are you going to do this sort of blob? Until we, made, we had a mock-up made of a piece of it, and we exhibited it at the Venice Biennale. And then they said, oh, yeah, it might be all right. We had the same thing with the scoops. The first pour, the contractors were very nervous. When they had the second pour, they said, oh, yeah, maybe it's going to be all right. Good on you. And, and uh, so there are these moments in, in a project where it tips from immense nervousness to, OK, it's going to happen. The north facade has to be very cheap. And I did a, a kind of simple approach to that one, which is to take all the windows that were necessary from the inside, just let them hang out, just let them come as they came. So if you, if you 
strip away and look at the window pattern. It's a real ramshackle pattern. This window, that, da, 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 da. and then you turn it into an artwork. You you paint it rather like a spotty face with a bit of lipstick on it or whatever. You know, you, you smear it with colour. And then you a trick that we did also in the Berlin housing, which is you pull the drain pipes against that. So you effectively make a painting of which the windows are one component. It seems to work and it's cheap. Quickly then, since one has been it for so long a teacher and a drawer, the, the, the history of this building in terms of what happened to it in terms of imagery I think is interesting. Here were the early visuals, the competition visuals, much more almost German expressionist in, in character. Stark, actually clearly already the same building, but starker, without the materiality, without the light. The studios actually, quite frankly, duller than the eventual one. Then we, we win the competition, we start to predict the layering of other materials. So this is a phase at which it's a little bit sweet. It's got the plywood and the colour and the cupboards and so on. It's a little bit kind of sweetie. Or there are members of the team who incorporate their girlfriends into the <laughs> into the thing uh, and, and, and start to have atmospherics. Uh, other people working on putting really stagey kind of atmospherics. And then the first illustrations of the outside of the building with the early version of the north facade which was much more kind of Swedish and, 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 her. and the inevitable thing that however much you draw and we are effect, essentially drawers there's a point at which the drawing stops and some guy digs a hole and puts concrete in it suddenly it's happening fast very fast there's no time to stop. And I think we have got away with um, a very unusual architecture school. I just hope that the faculty is as interesting as the building. <laughs> uh, it has its street. And, the, and of course the condition, though we keep the direct sunlight out virtually all the time, there is the change of light in this, I think, rather gothic building, the light that is trapped and appears late into the evening, and the light that occurs when the sun has moved around to the west. There's the studio side, therefore, which is open in a series of tiers. Our own design for the furniture, we managed to do a deal by which if we could keep the furniture at the cost of a normal Australian school, we could design our own. And we had it made in, in China, needless to say, <laughs> in order to do that, in Shenzhen. And the northern rooms, <laughs> if you're in England you say something's called the northern rooms, it's like a sort of dodgy hotel that gives the old Rotary Club space. But our northern, I, didn't, I couldn't think of any other description from them. They are the smaller rooms on the northern side. They are open, they are exposed to a certain degree to the student side. We felt that that was important, that they shouldn't be locked, these, these academics and researchers, and they shouldn't be locked away. They should be exposed to a degree. And they have their own particulars. We did nine types of, uh, nine types of furniture. Then in the nose are the senior academic rooms and the meeting rooms. And that goes into the nose. And the features <coughs> of the scoops that can, that can take juries, ad hoc, exhibitions, just people, a couple of people having a cup of coffee, or the sort of gossipy things, the bits where the real activity of the school goes on, out, away from the studio. Or that atmospheric thing of percolation, being able to sniff 
as the Germans would say, the blick, the moment of looking through. And of course, the, as soon as people, real people move in, becomes particular. And in summary, my predilection for noses, I don't know where it comes from. But even the corners of things become noses. And we were very lucky in a, a brilliant uh, company, the local company to, to Gold Coast, that did the joinery. Wonderful, extraordinary joinery, which follows our, our very particular enjoyment of percolating even into cupboards. I don't know what happens to the cockroaches, but we, we percolate into cupboards. And finally, the object in space, which we hope will reforest. They took down far too many trees, and we realized they took them down so they could get their trucks in easily, which is a terrible reason. And at night, and the noses, and the, the sort of painting of that facade. In the same town, it was then a competition for the uh, cultural center of Gold Coast, which we were in the last three of, but it was won by a very famous Australian firm called Ashton Raggett McDougall. Um, and here we also thought of the, these, they're, they're mostly theaters and galleries and large um, public buildings. We thought of the idea of scooping out the undercroft so that you could wait for people or hang around. They get occasionally torrential rain and a lot of the time very great amount of sunshine. So you want shelter, largely you need shelter. Um, and we made this series of large buildings with these, with these entrance con conditions of scoop. The, the, as a culture town, one has to be honest about the actual inhabitants of the town or visitors to the town. It attracts a certain kind of tourist, as, as shown in the illustrations. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're into Bach and Beethoven or Kandinsky, uh, but we mustn't be too comp sort of uh, snippy about them. I, I made a particular cartoon for the competition showing how various typical types of people who come to Gold Coast could be kind of eased into taking an interest in various quote-unquote cultures. And of course the kiosk is in there as part of the offering. And this is one of those typical as sunsets in the West uh, drawings of the, the complex. We just about go on site next week with Blue Building Number Four, our first monocoque construction, with um, Kara's office doing the engineering. I, of course, started off at this institution. This is the same institution that had the little architecture school, which then shut and then reopened as the, school, as the school as a whole became more famous and has now become a university, very famous for film and television design. I remember and know a lot of typical art students. So this is a sort of cartoon, really, though it, it pretends to be a, a, a section drawing. The building is small, tucked into a corner, also close to trees, but this time we're not taking very many out. It is in the simple tradition of the window. It's calculated. It's a studio for all the departments to share for drawing. It's constructed of prefabricated parts which will be trucked in from Holland. And recently I returned Oh, that's a funny one. It doesn't show the picture. Well, anyhow, I have returned to Bournemouth, that rather strange Arcadian town, 
And that doesn't work either. This is weird. That one does. That's one. <laughs> You're seeing just one random bit of the project. Doesn't matter. We've been sitting here a long time. And all I can say is keep sniffing. We still have some, some, thank you so much. Uh, we still have some, some, some time for questions. Uh, I would like to ask you first of all uh, about CRAB. I mean, it's, it's uh, obvious that it comes from the names, but it has a kind of more formal <laughs> consequences, the name of the film. I was seeing the, the plans of your mm -hmm. projects and mm -hmm. they were more and more connected with the biomorphism. Yes, I wonder about that. I, I'm always very suspicious about um, biomorphics for biomorphics' uh, sake. Uh, the, the Darcy Thompson book was very, very popular when I was a student, but I was the last person to read it. Um, I'm, oh, I, I, I suppose I have a, a built-in... Though I'm a teacher and a, a writer of books, and therefore sometimes you, you cut corners in order to clarify. You, you, you group people together and say, they are all constructivists, or they are all you know, English pragmatists. Or they are, but and you know they're not really, but if you start getting into it, it makes it too complicated. Um, but I'm always nervous of, of the label. The, the time I got most irritated with the label was uh, when we made the Grants Building, which got an enormous amount of publicity and publication. And everybody, nearly everybody, who wrote about it said it's an archigram building and da da da. And, and that made it easy for them because I, and, and, and there was a period about two, three years ago when I used to start lectures with two slides one slide of Plug in City. I said, that's Peter Cook when he was a young architect. One slide of Kunsthaus Grass, that's Peter Cook when he's an old architect. Now you can go home and tell everybody that's what it's about, end of conversation. If you're going to sit here longer, it, life will get more complicated. I will be deliberately undermining the clarity of that. And I think, and, and, and that's not just being perverse, it is that I think that Work is always affected by many, many crossing influences and moments. And, and, and you do carry in your head a kind of statement. It's not necessarily a statement that you can write down, but it is a kind of wish to say that particular thing at that particular moment. And it, it may be that, uh, like when we used to say, this will upset them. We knew exactly what we meant, that it would, would, would contradict the enormously sort of uh, self-satisfied English reasonableness. Uh, I think that that is the, the, the greatest weakness of the English, that they're reasonable. But I haven't answered your question. I've forgotten what the question was. Yeah, I mean, to make yeah. It work. <laughs> Uh, no, but I, I think the, uh, it's true what you say that you have noses. No, you, you have the, 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 some kind of a, this, this geometries that you think that you say that you don't know where they come from, that you mm. use them in your drawings of mm. landscapes or mm. wetlands. Or I tell you a funny thing. The drawing, I think, I'm, I'm, number one, I'm an incredibly messy drawer. When I was a pencil drawer, it was hopeless. I used to buy harder and harder pencils because I always made a mess on the paper. And I'm not a good drawer. I was not the best person in the class ever for drawing trees, dogs. You know, I can't do that stuff. And I have, number three, I've been often associated with people who are very good drawers. Uh, Ron Heron was a brilliant drawer. David Green is a brilliant drawer. Christine Hoare is a brilliant drawer. Gavin Rowbottom is a brilliant drawer. I've always been alongside somebody who was a properly good drawer, and therefore I've had to invent tricks not to let the side down. 
literally. And I, I'm somebody who has innumerable numbers of French curves and things and things I draw around and tricks. Gradually you get better at it, but I'm not a natural, but I'm fascinated by drawing and I found there was a breakthrough. And it's something to do with that arm movement, that action, when you use ink. And a fountain pen is one of my favorite drawing instruments. Pen tiles I don't get on so well with, but the fountain pen, you do, and you go like that. It's the arm movement that you make when you design something. If you say, there's a, there's a room, you know, hmm. you don't go, <coughs> <coughs> you go, hmm. and then you want to make something. And it's, it's the way the ink flows. And it was when I moved on to ink, after leaving Bournemouth and going to the A, I moved on to ink. And it was wonderful. It was like a revelation. I didn't have to worry about the dirt. And now I'm very weird because if I do a pencil drawing, I don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't get my head around. I, 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 can't, I itch to get to the ink. The computer I can't use anyhow. I'm only an editor, constantly going over with the pen. Um, but I like that. I like that movement. Because I don't know what my rationalization When we walk along, we, I don't think we do that. You don't go, eh, like a soldier. <laughs> you go, <laughs> You see somebody irritating in the street, you kind of go around. You see somebody you want to get close to, you go round. You, you know, I mean, if I come off your football stadium here and go to the toilet. I sort of do that, you know? And, and I, so to me, it is a post-rationalization of what one does, linearly. But that's a bit weak, really. I mean, I'm sure there's <laughs> justification for people who do this, you know? <laughs> I think it's very important <laughs> that you're saying that, but let's open to the audience. Who, who wants to have some questions? Uh, uh, oh. yep. um, I'm a visiting, uh, visiting scholar from Korea University, Seoul, and I really enjoyed your inspiring and entertaining lecture, and it's very honorable for me to take this lecture because I, every semester I taught about archigram, and yeah, I have many questions, but because of the time limitation, I uh, just, yeah, two questions, is, is it okay? The best one. Ah, best one. Yeah, then, very practical one concerning my um, present research related to the Japanese architect Terunobu Fujimori. I have read an article written by you in 2008, published in the Architectural Review, that you mentioned there. Um, Fujimori Terunobu uh, is the most, uh, the person that you wanted to meet most. Oh, yeah. And I know that you met Fujimori Terunobu because I uh, met Fujimori several times, and I want to know what points you uh, get from him. And also when Fujimori um, made an exhibition in London, Victoria and Albert Museum, you, you attended the lecture, I heard, and what, yeah, <laughs> what could you learn or inspire? Because several of your project assume some of his designed and, and also uh, when Fujimori was a student he was also very much influenced by Akigram. I didn't know that bit. Um, I, I did make it my business to meet Fujimori because I discovered that he's a close friend of Toyo Ito who I also am a friend of and, and Toyo organized that we met and then my wife and I were invited by Fujimori out to his house uh, which is the one with the little trees coming out of the top, except that most of them have died off. But, um, and, and what's interesting is that it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, how long do you want the answer to this to go on? <laughs> it could be a 15 minute. Um, we found that it was right on the edge of Tokyo, like about two trains, and, and there are chickens running around in the, in the back garden. And this is an important point. And, and the house is an extension of an existing house, fairly ordinary house. And then the Fujimori bit has been grafted onto the side. And he doesn't speak English, but his wife teaches English. So that was fine. So we <laughs> and uh, I 
discovered that I didn't know that he knew about my stuff, but I, I, I had a sniff that he had been looking at the English arts and crafts mo movement. There's certain things that he does, which you sort of think, I know that stuff. It's, it's arts and crafts. And in fact, his wife confirmed that, in fact, he has studied the English arts and crafts mo movement. Uh, and then, on I think, a, a separate visit to to Japan, he invited us to go up to see the tree houses and to see his, and to meet his mother and to see the little museum that he's done. And also a new, a new, newer Fujimori hanging, kind of hanging egg. And uh, I think it's interesting that Fujimori still interests me just as much. So he was somebody I wanted to meet and I did meet and have met a few times since. Uh, I'm intrigued by a very good piece of writing that is at the back of one of the, uh, well translated, I suspect, by one of his friends about how he's extremely humorous. He's, he's apparently hilariously funny and people fall about in stitches and very ironic. But I think he is a personification of, of an interesting kind of loop. Of, he is, after all, as I understand it, an extremely serious architectural historian. He was a professor of architecture before he started building this strange stuff. And it's not so strange. I mean, when you're there, <laughs> yes, it, it, it's kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, it's his city, his funny cities that look like kind of beehives. I think I'd love to see one of those built. I, I think that his illustration of, of a sort of perverse academy dare I call it, which exists out there in the world, of which Roberto Burley Marx would have been a member, of which Enrique Mirais was inevitably a member, of which a number of people, you know, Hans Pelsig would have been a member. There's, a, there's a, my special list of people, <coughs> some sadly dead, some still alive, uh, which do a loop. They are both erudite, they are both very aware of correct architecture and yet they themselves do something my the illustration of that was many years ago i gave a lecture in norman oklahoma at the the architecture school which at that time was in the belly of a football stadium which i love but there was an old german uh, librarian there and bruce goff had, i think he hadn't quite died yet but he, he wasn't in town at the time <laughs> And she put, she was a very keen lady, and I went into this library, and she said, we have so, all so, editions of the Blaubuscher, the Blaubuscher, the, the, the famous Bosmut collection of all the modernist canon. And she said, Mr. Goff insisted that we get these books. Bruce Goff, who was, many people think, was sort of loony, and did this weird shit stuff. But he insisted that all the correct books from Germany were in the library. And I think, you know, and another person I know well who's Svi Hecker, uh, when, before he moved to Berlin, had an amazing library of very correct stuff books, but his own stuff whirls around. And I think that ought to be talked about, that some of the apparently nuttiest designers are actually very well informed. They have just not chosen to do the correct thing. They know it doesn't mean they don't know it, but they have chosen not to. In parallel with the fact that, you know, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, uh, and, and yeah, the third one I'm trying to remember the name of, were all trained as classical pianists and can do their Mozart if they have to, they choose mostly not to. And I think that's, in, whereas most people say, if we're being taught the correct thing, that's what we must do. The rest is nutty stuff. So I think that was a sort of rather long-winded comment on, on Fujimori. And it's lovely, I mean, it appeals to the English sense of the tragic, that the trees on the top of his house don't really work. <laughs> because that makes the guy human. If they work brilliantly, 
say, my God, you know, why doesn't every house have trees on top of it? But the proposition is more important than if they work, I suspect. to continue? Any other? Uh, well, I think it's enough. Yeah, I think it's enough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>